Hi guys, this is Donnie. Um, this video here is going to be a little bit unusual. Um, it's probably going to be the first that I've ever done on my channel since I've started the channel um, roughly about two and a half years ago. Um, but recently I went on a uh, video. Well, I don't want to say recently. It's probably been upwards of a year ago when I made this comment. But if you'll go to my channel, um, you'll see the different playlists that I have. Well, one of my playlists is Soft Tissue and Dinosaur Fossils. Soft Tissue and Dinosaur Fossils. And so there's um, several interviews, um, really all the interviews there that you'll see there um, has to do with Mary Schweitzer. Now, um, I've uploaded one that I got from a local PBS station um, where I live at. and uh, But it has sparked a huge debate. Um, in um, scientific circles, and uh, the creationists, of course, would um, latch on to something like this because it does support the fact that um, that these animals are not millions and millions of years old, and so. Uh, but it supports more of a younger Earth, um, and that would fall along with the biblical timeline of six thousand years. And so, but if you'll click on to that one, it's Nova Science Now. What I did is I actually added it in. I did not upload this one. I just added it into my playlist. But it's Nova Science Now, T-Rex blood. And once you click on to it, you'll see the comments down there. Now, a year ago, if you'll notice here on the screen, if, a year ago, I made the comment. Awesome clip. I love it. Genesis 1-1 explains it all. And uh, so... Well, if you'll notice right below that, it says view 94 replies. <laughs> 94 replies. So what happened is um, I got a response from a channel called Logical Atheist. Logical Atheist. And he all he said was Genesis is pure fiction. That's all he said. So... You know me, you know, I. people probably think, Donna, you're laid back. I'm kind of surprised at you. But I came back and said, maybe in your fictional world. And it was on from there. And so uh, most of the interaction is just between him and me. Now, what happened is Raw Matt, um, he has his own um, channel. That's R-A-W space M-A-T-T, -T, Raw Matt. He's also connected with Standing for Truth. He does a lot of their video editing. And um, and I'm going to show you um, a screen pick of their channel. But Standing for Truth, if you like to debate, if you want to see stuff like this, um, you really need to check out that channel. They go into all types of stuff. They have professors on there. They have lots of debates. Um, and they have, um, uh, you know, just videos where people are just, you know, having a chat se chat session about whatever, whatever topic it is. And so, um, but it is a good a good channel that I think you guys need to check out. But any rate, so uh, logical atheist and me, we get into an exchange um, back and forth. And so he has several standing or well, stances that he has. Um, that he believes or he stands by, and then, of course, I have mine. And so what I'm going to do here in this video is I'm kind of tired of going back and forth with him, to tell you the truth. Um, and so it just seems to be going round and round. We're not really getting anywhere. And so I really want this video to help those out there that may hear this type of information these type of questions because a lot of these folks seem to just rehash the same old arguments. Um, they don't really spout out anything new. It's always attacking the Bible, um, you know, or, or God in general. Where is he? I need some proof. I want to see him. Um, you can't prove he exists and stuff like that. And, um, and so let me just remind those out there that that's not our job. As amazing as that is, my job is not to prove to logical atheists and those of his like that there is a God. I'm not even, it don't matter. It really don't matter. If you look in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, especially in the Old Testament, whenever God sent in a messenger, 
He sent in a messenger to do one thing and one thing one thing only, and that was to warn, hey, judgment's coming if you don't repent. He didn't go in there and say, okay, when you say go, I'm going to come down from the sky. I'm going to send a bolt of lightning. Now, and now with the Egyptians, with the Egyptians, he did send some signs. Now, some of those signs, the um, their magicians, the Egyptians' magicians, was able to duplicate it. And other ones, they were not able to duplicate. And so that's the one thing we need to remember about signs and wonders. And that was the one thing that um, logical atheists kept saying over and over and over again. Um, extraordinary claims needs to have extraordinary evidences. And so we need to remember that, um, uh, one, that when you get into that mindset, you are open for all types of demonic activity, um, but you're also um, opening yourself up to false, false signs and wonders. And that is what the Antichrist will show um, during the tribulation period or during that time when he's on this earth. He will do signs and wonders, and people will literally think that this guy is the Messiah. And so with God, it's all about faith. And so we're going to look at some scriptures when it comes to that. But we're not here to necessarily, and i got to use this um, in the right way, we're not necessarily here to defend the Bible, I guess you could say. We are here to witness, and whether these folks believe it or not is all on them. It's all on them. Um, there were people in Jesus' times that says they, they wanted to see a sign and a wonder. And Jesus told them that only a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. But a sign would not be given them except the sign of Jonah. And what was that? Well, Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. Jesus would be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He was basically saying that the only sign you're going to get is me raising from the dead, is what he was saying. And so were well, these folks constantly are looking at I want to see a sign. I want to see this. I want to see that. And I'm going to tell you right now, towards the end of this video, we're going to go through a little bit of Scripture while I'm going to back up the claim that we don't have to show anything, not one thing, and I can give you Scripture to prove it. And so for logical atheists, this is for you. Um, you brought up some things, and I'm going to show you some things that you brought up, um, mainly because texting don't seem to be doing it with us. Um, and so I started noticing towards the end of our um, of our uh, of our chat back and forth, um, he even be he, he, either it was him or he let somebody else join in on the on the chat and started typing, began using curse words. And so you're just getting angrier and angrier, as I can see. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you. I'm going to show you some of the things that you brought up. And you can come on my channel, and you can come on Raw Matt's channel, and you can come on Standing for Truth's channel. All the things that you brought up are answered on our channels, and that's if you are willing to take the step to look at them. And so, because uh, we can go round and round and round. And the bottom line is, is if you refuse to believe the Bible, that is your choice. That is your choice. We're just here. All our responsibility as Christians are to do is just to present the material, present the judgments, just like they did in the Old Testament. Uh, God told Jeremiah, not one person is going to believe you, but I want you to go in there anyway. And so he went in there anyway, and nobody listened to him. And he pronounced judgment on these people. And, of course, they were taken off by Babylon. And so um, Jonah, Jonah was one. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh and pronounce judgment. But he was supposed to go in there and say, in 40 days, judgment's going to happen. And so that's what he went in there. And he didn't want these people to, to repent. He wanted them to die. But he went in there, and all he said was, 40 days, and then destruction. That's all it was. He didn't say, hey, God's real. Um, well, this is what it says here. You know, I'm going to tell you right now that, you know, it's because of this and this and this that God is real. No, he just went in there. He didn't say nothing about trying to prove to them that God exists. He went in there with judgment, and those people repented, and God had mercy on them, mainly because of the children that were in that city. And so 
you know, again, you know, it's we're not here to try to prove our point. Um, we present it, we show it, you believe it, or you don't. It's as simple as that. And so, but let's move a lot right along here. And this is one of the, what I'm going to do here, y'all, is I'm going to highlight his um, text that he said in here. And so this is one of them that he said. This, was, this one was directed to me. Um, he says, Bible doesn't answer anything. It's mainly unverifiable. Um, claims, mostly far-fetched and obviously wrong. Always the Bible is garbage. You can see where he's attacking the Bible. He's attacking it. That's a common thing in this. Evolution has nothing to do with dinosaur soft bone tissue. You clearly don't understand what she found. 80 million year old T-Rex bone, T -rex bone 80 million years ago, under rare circumstance, it was preserved for millions of years. Oh, yeah, I bet so. It doesn't disprove evolution whatsoever. And then he's got LMAO. You guys understand what that is. Um, thanks to upgrades in technology, she was able to extract a hemoglo hemoglobin. Fact is, dinosaurs still died off 65 million years ago. Evolution is a well-established scientific fact. That's what that's right there is what amazed me. Evolution is a well established scientific fact. Show me one fact. Show me a fossil. Show me a transition fossil. We're talking about macroevolution here. Um, they use microevolution to uh, to uh, define macroevolution. Now, microevolution would be the um, the variations in a in a kind of animal. Macroevolution is a cat turning into a dog. I want to see one fact. Oh, show me one fossil that shows this. All right. He goes on to say, and no logical person cares about what the Bible has to say in reality. If you take it literally, that's your problem, not mine. Okay. Uh, well, the, as you can see here, he is stating here that evolution is a well-established scientific fact. And so, again, this is some of the things that we kept getting, but nothing was ever shown in these texts. Now, he goes to say that I don't understand what she found. In actuality, I do understand what she was found. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to my dinosaur and history presentation, and I'm going to show you what she found, okay? Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to go through some articles, and these are from some slides from my Dinosaur in History presentation here that cover what Mary Schweitzer found. Okay, so let's start off here. Paleontologists recently dug up a massive thigh bone of a Tyrannosaurus rex in Montana's Hell Creek Formation, a rich source of fossils. It was so big the team called for a helicopter to hoist it out, but it was still too big, so they reluctantly cut it in half. The team estimated its age at 70 million years, but when they cut the fossil, they found real bone, not stone. Now, for those of you, including logical atheists, um, my references are at the bottom of the screen, so you can look at any of this stuff, and if you want to do some double checking on this, go right ahead. Now, let's look at this uh, geologic time scale. Now, let me just say, um, logical atheist and those out there, that this is the only place you're going to find it at. You will never see this in the real world, okay? Now, you've got what you got is the time of the dinosaurs in the Jurassic and Cretaceous period. Now, at the end of the Triassic period, that's when the smaller dinosaurs became on the scene. Now, what I'm doing is I'm taking evolutionary um, type type of um, definitions here of how this all came about. This isn't the creation model here, all right? So for um, logical atheists who says, I don't understand evolution and science and what they refer to as science, I'm going to give you some little definitions here. So the Triassic, Jurassic, and Tr Cretaceous period is go towards the end of the Triassic all the way through the Cretaceous is the time of the dinosaurs. Now, Jurassic is where we get that word whenever you see that one movie, the, um, Jurassic World. Um, that's where they got that word from because it's the time of the dinosaurs. Now, there, um, in evolutionary definitions or teaching, they say that the dinosaurs died off around 60 to 65 million years ago. And then evolution, and then evolution of humans started somewhere between 1.8 to 5.6 million years ago. They don't know, but they really don't know because it's a guess. All this is 
under the um, teaching of a theory, which a theory is nothing more than just a guess. There's no proof of it. That's the reason it's still called the theory of evolution. And so that's what this uh, geologic time scale is. Okay? Now, the Hell Creek Formation now, now that right there is a great big old sedimentary layer right there, the Hell Creek Formation, which can only be laid down by a catastrophic flood event. That's where this T-Rex thigh bone was found. It occurs in Montana, parts of North and South Dakota, and Wyoming. You're not going to get this from a local flood. Most exciting of all, they found soft tissue like a wet scab on human skin, including blood vessels and whole bone cells and blood cells. Mary Higby Schweitzer of North Carolina State University, who conducted the study, said the vessels were transparent, flexible, and in some cases their contents could be squeezed out. Her findings were published in the journal Science. She went on to say, preservation of this extent where you still have this flexibility and transparency has never been seen in a dinosaur before. I guess not. One thing is because they don't look because their theory of evolution don't allow for this. So this is what they found. Check a look at it. Photo A shows fragment is resilient, and when stretched, arrow, it returns to its original shape. Photo B shows the bone and A after air drying. The overall structure and functional characteristics remain after dehydration. Photo C shows regions of bone showing fibrous character. That's where the arrows are at. These characteristics are not normally seen in fossil bone. So here you go. Here's some more pictures of that. Now again, y'all, upwards of 60 to 65 million years. Million years. It's hard for the human brain to gravitate that time period. You're not going to get anything that's going to last 60 to 65 million years. There's just no way. There's no way. What appeared to be supple bone cells, three-dimensional shapes intact, and translucent blood vessels that looked as if they could have come straight from ostrich at the zoo. Now, that was it's not just coincidence that they said that. They're trying to, to connect dinosaurs and birds together. They're trying to say that dinosaurs turned into the birds that we have today. Now, that right there is what we call macroevolution. That's not micro. That's macroevolution, which has never, ever been observable. Since the discovery, she, Mary Schweitzer, has found similar samples of soft tissue in other T. rex fossils and a hadrosaur. Associate paleontologist, paleontologist Jack Horner said he hoped museums all over the world would start cracking open bones and start looking for soft tissue in their fossils. To study the cellular and molecular structures of these things, you have to do that. The good stuff is on the inside. And so I was really kind of amazed that um, Jack Horner encourage other people to start doing this. You'd think they'd try to shy away from it. But again, for some reason, they think that soft tissue is going to span millions of years of time and going to stay where you could literally squeeze out the contents. A few thousand years is amazing, but it's a whole lot more believable than 65 million years. Now, National Geographic News quoted um, Mary Schweitzer, the, finding these tissues in dinosaurs changes the way we think about fossilization. Now listen to this logical atheist, because our theories of fossils, of how fossils are preserved, don't allow for this soft tissue preservation. That right there came out of their own mouths. The last part of the article, National Geographic read, if protein sequences can be identified, they can be compared to those of living animals. This might allow a better understanding of how different groups of animals are related. Now, you know what? Now they're going into fairyland right there. Um, and so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you the tree of life. This is evolution's tree of life, y'all. Look down here at the very bottom where it ain't nothing but just worms bacteria and what they're saying here is that every single thing on the planet is related to each other genetically that is so hogwash it has never been proven there is no way look at all this we're talking us humans being related to a plant a fish 
a reptile, the dinosaurs. Look, the humans is the very top. Ridiculous. All right, now here, I'm going to go ahead and hit this. I'm going to go ahead and kick this dog real good while we got it. Dinosaurs related to birds, all right? Dinosaurs are related to birds. Dinosaurs turned into birds, okay? Now, this is in, um, I'm going to say that's Liaoning, China. We're going to look at this fossil right here. And if you notice this fossil here, it's in what's called the death pose. You notice because the, the head is thrown back and it looks like it's gasping for air. Now, many of these dinosaurs have been seen as if they were swimming. They were in a liquid state before they died. But if you notice in that stomach area, there's something in that stomach. What's quite interesting that there's remains of three birds found in that stomach. Now, I did say birds in the stomach. It's in that animal, in that dinosaur right there. That's that bird. Birds must have been consumed in fairly rapid succession. Now, personally me, it is my opinion um, that, these, uh, that this animal died at the beginning stages of the flood or near the ending of the flood, and what it was doing is it couldn't find any food to eat, and it was starving, and it just started eating whatever it could get its mouth on, and it ate three birds in rapid succession. The bones of the birds are in that animal capable of powered flight and also had a beak rather than teeth. Now I'm talking about the birds. I'm not talking about the dinosaur. The fact that there were three undigested birds, one had decayed along a bit further in the dinosaur's stomach shows that the dinosaur died and was buried shortly after it had eaten. And so, um, and, and, and notice this. Let's go ahead and, and, and knock this too because I need to to show you when it comes to that little tree of life, everything being connected. When you get into the Bible, Bible has a lot more science than you think of. 1 Corinthians 15.39. 1 Corinthians 15.39. Note this down. It's King James Version. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another kind of flesh of beast, another of fishes, and another of birds. Now, going back to that tree of life, it's showing us all together all together, and you can't prove not one of them. But the Bible states that we're all separate. We're not the same flesh. And isn't that amazing? Because that's exactly what we are. And that, my friend, is observable science. Now, here's some more dinosaurs. Just so you, Mr. Um, logical Atheist, I just want to make sure you understand that I do understand what she found because they found soft tissue in other dinosaurs. Here's a Triceratops. Schweitzer and her colleagues found branched and tapering blood vessels that remained springy 65 million years after the animal died. Here, too likely, red blood cells are seen within a possible blood vessel. That is the actual picture, my friend. All right, um, here's another one. I'm going to try this. It's a duckbill dinosaur. It's a Brachia lophosaurus. All right, dated at 78 million years ago. 78 million years ago. And here's that picture on the left-hand side. The team found highly fragmented, though still pliable blood vessels containing pigmentation and possible red blood cells. 78 million years ago. Mm -hmm. When asked about her reaction when she realized what she was looking at, soft tissue, Mary gave this response. Yeah, it did sort of blow my mind, still does. I spent about three weeks saying that I couldn't be seeing what it looked like I was seeing. I kept looking at them over and over, and I would get goosebumps. I kept thinking that there had to be some type of mistake, some kind of mistake. And I had my technician repeat the studies over and over and over with new chunks of bone to be sure we could get the same results. So they kept doing it over and over and over over again. Now that is repeatable and it's observable. What do we call that? That's what you call science. That's science. It's when it's repeatable and it's observable. Evolution is neither of those. Okay? Neither. Back in the lab, uh, Schweitzer and her technician demineralized the fragments by soaking them in a weak acid. As the fossil dissolved, transparent vessels were left behind. It was totally shocking. I didn't believe it until we done it 17 times. Observable, repeatable. That's science. Okay, he goes on with another comment. Evolution doesn't lack evidence. It is a well-established fact. It was even a Christian evolutionary biologist that helped link other apes and humans by figuring out chromosome 2 was fused in humans. 
Chromosome 2 was fused in humans. Um, evolution would be a scientific fact, not a belief. Um, evolution is true even if you deny it. Beauty of science. I can help you understand if you wish. Evolution does not affect a God existing or not existing as theists think a God uses evolution as a mechanism for life. What he's saying is he's trying to say that what well, what that belief is called theistic evolution. It's called theistic evolution where they say God used evolution to get us here. And so, um, you know, again, that goes contrary to everything against Scripture. There's nowhere in Scripture that you can prove that. And so um, that's what I'm saying. We get off the Scriptures, we get into these wild ideas, these fairyland beliefs. Uh, and so why don't we just give God the glory of what he did? We have a God that can use it. He can say it. He can create everything in one second if he wanted to. Um, but he did it in 24-hour periods, six 24-hour periods, literal. It says it. It says the evening and the morning, the first sec, the first day. The evening and the morning, the second day. Easy, simple to understand. We make it so hard. Um, but let's go to this chromosome number two. Raw Matt did this for Standing for Truth. Outstanding job. This video is about 15 minutes, 50 minutes long. I took eight and a half minutes of it. But it answers this guy's comment about chromosome number two. Their simplistic portrayal to the public of chromosome two in combination of looking for only similarities and ignoring the vast differences will be exposed in this video. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Chromosome two is used as one of their favorite examples of the ancient ancestral primitive man-human split that occurred around six to seven million years ago during a bottleneck. The general model touted by evolutionary scientists is that the chromosome 2 fusion event was a head-to-head -head telomeric fusion. However, because the alleged fusion site is so small and degenerate, evolutionists in general propose that somehow the telomere repeats must have degenerated, and that this must be why they do not align as expected. So what they do is they lay the two chimp chromosomes, number 12 and 13, next to one another, then place the human chromosome 2 next to those, and then they will simply say, well, sitting in the middle of the chromosome, there looks to be two sets of degenerative telomeres. So they say, see, these are the remnants of an ancient telomeres that fused. But then they ignore why it's so degenerate, and never ask, why aren't there more telomere sequences at these two extra telomere locations? Well, because it's not a fusion site. It's not two old telomeres fused together. This is why they do not look like telomeres. You see, they have committed a logical fallacy called affirming the consequent. Basically, it goes something like this. If grass is wet, well, it must have rained. But grass could be wet for a number of reasons. Dew from cold temperature in the morning. Someone watered it. A dog just peed on it. There's a variety of reasons. It doesn't have to only be rain. The same is true here. Just because the human chromosome 2 looks like a fusion event doesn't mean that it is the result of a fusion. That's a logical fallacy. This statement here comes from researcher Casey Luskin regarding the chromosome 2 fusion site. He says, Evidence for fusion in the human chromosome tells you little to nothing about whether humans share a common ancestor with living apes. The human chromosome fusion argument focuses on a fusion event that is specific to the human line and therefore provides a highly limited form of evidence for human ape common ancestry. Evidence for a chromosomal fusion event is not evidence for when that event took place, nor is it evidence for the ancestry prior to that event. Basically what he's saying is if humans did diverge from chimps, this fusion only happened once we were already fully human anyway, so it cannot be used as evidence for a human-chimp split. Because remember, chimps still have 48 chromosomes, and we only have 46 chromosomes. So it could only have happened after we were fully human, or else chimps today would also have been affected having the same 46 chromosomes as us. Remember everyone, this is just a story. It's not like they go into the fossils and find this evidence. 
They just noticed a long time ago that the humans are one chromosome short and concluded the obvious, that if evolution was true and we came from chimps, then there must have been a fusion. Their belief dictated the science and what is true to them. So they told the public it was a prediction, but it was obvious that they needed to find this, so they went looking for it. They found a section that fit the criteria to sell the story and never looked back. This is why they looked so hard for evidence to prove it. They needed to be true. So it is. And yes, they are willing to bet it all on this. Look at what Ken Miller, the evolutionist, says. You know what? If we don't find it, evolution is wrong, and we don't share a common ancestor. Sadly for them, this video falsifies the chromosome 2 theory completely, proving we don't share a common ancestor with apes. So we can look at man's assumption of the past or at God's unchanging word on the past. Even other secular scientists who believe humans split from orangutans get mad at the biased, hard-headed, dogmatic scientists who won't look at their evidence because they are so set on chimps being the last ancestor to humans. Look at what they say. Molecular comparisons between humans and chimps are often flawed. There is no theory holding that molecular similarity necessarily implies an evolutionary relationship, and molecular data that contradicts the idea that genetic similarity denotes relation is often dismissed. So you heard it from their mouth. Talk about being thrown under the bus by your own side. We already know the evolutionary agenda and why they ignore falsification and evidence that counters the idea, but I feel it's good to point out for those that do not know it. Next. They show the public that there is an extra centromere in the chromosome 2 that is degenerate, thus assuming again that it was part of the ape pre-split. What I'm wondering is why is this evidence? There are many chromosomes that supposedly have degenerate centromeres in them that have never fused or lack them entirely, so it's hardly good evidence. But I digress. We also know errors in centromeres are catastrophic for cells. So if the ape chromosome fused with a human one, it would have left two active centromeres on the human chromosome too. But there's only one. So, evolutionists have to say the 2P centromere remained active, whereas the 2Q centromere was inactivated. Well, the only way the 2P centromere could fuse and leave behind a broken centromere would be for 2Q in apes to not have satellite. Since 2Q does not, they think this is evidence for the fusion because 2P probably took its place. Since they believe they are looking at a degenerate centromere overwritten by centromere 2P, they do not even bother to look for a function there. So by them assuming this centromere deletion model, they have already concluded that the fusion event is true and did happen, and without question, are just looking for explanations as to why the so-called dead centromere got this way. Because if they look objectively at the evidence, they find that there is no indication of the inactivated centromere remains. It's all hypothetical at best, and actually impossible when they discovered the function just recently. So finally, after all these decades, they finally found a scenario to line up with part of their story. You see, they needed some kind of mechanism to go along with the lack of evidence that has plagued them from the start. So now, rather than just use the obvious conclusion that the lack of an extra centromere means chromosome 2 was not a fusion site, they had to come up with an alternative theory that can account for this. They finally have this one, and use it as proof while spouting more lies to kids and playing word games with the public, saying, What we see in human chromosome 2 is exactly what we would expect if there was a fusion. No, it's not. It's their viewpoint based on what they're choosing to look for. So they can either go with that conclusion, which falsifies chromosome 2 as being the result of a fusion, or they can use the unscientific theory that says the active chromosomes fused, or that they broke off prior to that, and that centromere 2q was inactivated by 2p, which has been found to be an active gene site. Or they can choose the obvious conclusion, that it was never a fused chromosome in the first place, and that is why all these anomalies exist. What they are secretly pushing and trying to tell us what happened is that two active telomere-protected chromosomes in chimps and an active telomere-protected chromosome in humans 
both at the same time had to all lose their active telomeres at the same time. And these would then all have to fuse to create a new stable Chimera hybrid cross-species chromosome. Get real. That's why they don't tell the public that scenario. Guys, what we're going to do is this is just going to be part one. Part one. Um, I may make this a couple videos just to make sure we get through um, the few comments that were made and kind of clarify with everyone else um, and my friends over at Standing for Truth. Um, if you want to chime in with anything, um, by all means, um, let me know. And um, and again, maybe we can let this um, interaction with this uh, with this other channel. Uh, maybe go ahead and clarify some other things that other people um, may have in, in the same area. And so, uh, but at any rate, you guys take care. Be looking for the next one.